uh, welcome to our webinar today, What is Public Policy, presented by John Stapleton. This is the first uh, webinar in a series of webinars, six in total, that John will be presenting, um, which he will speak to a little bit f further, but we're, we're very happy to have him here. Uh, my name is Allison Mullen. I'm the Manager of Communications and Marketing here at Essential Skills Ontario. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give you a few instructions. On the right-hand side of your screen is your dashboard, and there you can chat with each other in the chat pane and ask questions in the, the questions pane. Uh, if it's a technical question, myself, I will uh, try to answer it and assist you. Um, if you have questions about the content, uh, feel free to ask it at any time in the questions pane, and then I will ask um, John at the end of the webinar when we get to the question and answer uh, section. We do want to make this webinar as interactive as we can, so if you'd like to participate online and keep the conversation going on Twitter, uh, just use the hashtag ESOWeb. So now to introduce our presenter. Uh, John Stapleton worked for the Ontario government in the Ministry of Community and Social Services and his predecessors for 28 years in the areas of social assistance policy and operations. Uh, during his career, John was the senior policy advisor to the Social Assistance Review Committee and the Minister's Advisory Group on New Legislation. His more recent government work concerned the implementation of the National Child Benefit. He is a commissioner with the Ontario Soldiers Aid Commission and is a volunteer with St. Christopher's House and Wood Green Community Services of Toronto. Uh, John was research director for the Task Force on Modernizing Income Security for Working Age Adults in Toronto and was the co-chair of the working group associated with this project. He is undertaking an innovation fellowship uh, with the Metcalf Foundation currently. Uh, he teaches public policy and is a member of the 25 and 5. So uh, I'm now going to pass it on to John to take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, the first of uh, the six seminars that are going to take place it's, uh, now in the late fall and, uh, and into the winter. And uh, this is, in many ways, trying to uh, give you a grounding uh, for the other five seminars. Um, I, the course that I teach at Wood Green uh, has 28 modules, and each uh, year we start in January and, um, and go through to um, uh, December. So I'm just ending up um, right about now. We're in about the 24th module with the uh, 15 students that I have there. I've done this for the last three years. Uh, I also taught at the uh, Maitre uh, Public Policy Training Institute and the Schulich School of Nonprofit Management and um, finally ended up in a position where there was no um, community-based public policy courses going on. So I was sitting there with 500 slides and nowhere to go. So I uh, uh, ventured out on my own in the, in the community and mostly do um, public policy, not to teach people how to do it, but actually to try and teach um, people what public policy is about and how government does it. So with um, no further ado, we will, um, we will head in. First of all, and so the first slide shows that what we're trying to do today for the, um, for the short time we have is first of all to clarify some basic vocabulary, what public policy is, what policy development is. Secondly, to better understand the idea of policy as the language of government. In other words, we speak English, um, government does speak policy uh, or a policy form of English. So it's, it's kind of what they do. Uh, and we're also going to explore some common errors, the difference between good and bad policy. And fourthly, to investigate whose job it is to develop public policy options. Well, so, yes, so here we are. What is policy? I'm still learning how to use these buttons here, but I think I got it now. All right, so uh, policy, people use the term policy for all sorts of things. They'll say, like, uh, what's your policy Whether on how I fill in this form? Um, can I do it on green? Can I fax it to you? Uh, what's your policy on email and that sort of thing? And I'm not going to talk about that form of policy today, and I'm not going to talk about insurance policies except for one slide. So we, we use policy all the time to mean a whole bunch of different things. We use policy to mean practices. We mean use policy to connote rules. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is big P policy. And I searched for years, literally, to get the simplest 
possible definition of, uh, of public uh, of public policy. And, uh, and finally, founded on something we'll see in a later slide, that uh, founded on a place uh, on the internet called answers.com. And after looking at all the different textbooks that cost hundreds of dollars in some cases, right through to Wikipedia and others, uh, I finally got this definition that we'll get on the next slide. Um, so what we mean at, by big P policy is the articulation of a course of action. So an advocate might want something, but if they're going to do policy advocacy, or an activist might want something, but if they're going to do policy activism, then they are also going to add to their, their discussion. They're going, to, they're going to also talk about the articulation of a course of action. Now, many advocates and many activists and maybe people, members of the public will, or people just working in their jobs will say it's really the job of government, municipal, provincial, municipal, um, all their agencies, boards and commissions, the public service, the various ministries and crown corporations. So it's really up to them. And I'm saying to really join the public policy conversation, I use the, the, the same analog as learning a language and being, coming, becoming fluent in a language is you're really joining a community. So if you want to join the policy community, you really have to be part of that articulation of a course of action. So it's not just that I want something, but I'm willing to go the extra step to think about how you would actually articulate that course of action. So some good uh, you know, it can be really vague, like Obama and change in the, uh, the last U.S. election, uh, that e even one word, you can have uh, talking about uh, crime, your, your policy is prisons. You know, they, you can have one word policies that are quite vague, and then you can have very articulate, very articulated and closely, uh, uh, and closely um, tuned courses of action. I encourage everybody to read the, uh, the free PDF that's available at the Caledon Institute, uh, What is Policy? And I do use this in, uh, in the course I teach, actually, in the first module. We, uh, we, we look at it. It's kind of a, a pithy document. You know, it really goes into some, some real detail and really will challenge you. But I think it's really important to to read Sherry Torsman's uh, article on what is policy, because she talks about it completely in the abstract and then gives examples. So again, when we're thinking of small p policy, I, I tend to ask, what I try to do is to ask, what is policy to a parking lot attendant? Well, it might be, in most cases, it's going to be a set of rules. It's going to be like, you can't park here. We're not, a, we're not responsible for damages, however caused, even absurd rules like that. Um, that's really not the policy that I want to talk about today. I don't want to talk about the policy in the sense of rules, but in the terms of articulating a course of action. So for a parking lot attendant, policy is a set of rules that those set of policies or rules are handed to the parking lot attendant, and then the parking lot attendant communicates those rules to, to people um, who are parking at the, uh, at the lot. And they're all preset. There's zero tolerance. It means there's no discretion. When they say you can't, you know, there's no in and out privileges, that means there's no in and out privileges. It's not a matter of discussion. It's not a matter of policy debate. Um, and so it's only big P policy, the articulation course of action that really is part of debate. And of course, what governments do in question period and committees and at city councils is they have debate. And they talk about what they are So the, the course of action is on set jello. And they're trying to set it in place so that they uh, move forward. So turning to big P policy on its own, we're talking about big P policy is the articulation of a plan or course of action intended to influence and determine decisions, actions, and other matters. So if you go to answers.com, you'll see how closely I, I uh, stole this definition from their website. And so at, at each point in in, in, uh, in the courses I do, uh, people will ask the, the question, now what is, what, what's policy again? And I keep saying, remember that it's the articulation of a plan or course of action intended to influence other things. And just if you can keep that with you and, and, and know that wanting something like to end world hunger or to have a, 
a better environment might be something that you want, but at the same time, you're not articulating your course of action to get it and actually putting things in place. And when you do, you have, you are in the act of developing policy, articulating policy, and doing policy analysis as part of the, uh, the evidence um, gathering process that you take, uh, the, the, that you engage in for that. So let's, uh, let's move along to where policy is announced. Um, it's very important for people who are uh, interested in policy to know that there is a policy time of year. I actually have that as one of my modules in my policy course. And because uh, policy often gets done in government when, uh, when uh, the, the actual parliament is on vacation. So it's often placed times like summers and uh, the time where people mostly go away. So that's when policy is uh, often getting made. And then when the government comes back, like the recent prorogation of the, uh, the provincial government, for example, they'll come back with a new premier, an unelected premier, who will come back, develop policy, and then provide a speech from the throne. So our two senior levels of government, both the federal and provincial governments, which are both um, Westminster uh, forms of government, taken from the British, where they have a House of Commons and uh, Prime Minister, or Premier, and uh, have rules of parliamentary procedure, such as cabinet solidarity, uh, issues like that. Um, that they will have a speech from the throne, which is delivered by the Lieutenant Governor and Council, or in the federal case, the Governor General. And at the city, you will have um, uh, you'll have a very different form because the uh, the, the Westminster rules do not apply at the city, so you might have it in the, uh, for example, in a budget. But of course, in, in all governments, it'll be like a a, a speech or a set a, a, a policy statement. Uh, from a mayor, a premier, a prime minister, uh, and policy can also be announced in the study. We had a recent social assistance review in Ontario where uh, uh, two commissioners um, put out a report called Brighter Prospects that uh, sets forth what they think government policy should be. And usually when governments commission reviews, they, uh, they do intend to act on them in some way. There's always a problem if they don't act on anything. So increasingly, uh, policies are being announced as part of budgets and budget, big budget bills, sometimes which are called omnibus bills. And an omnibus bill um, is so-called, uh, omni means all in, in, uh, in Latin, and it just means that you'll go in and amend a whole bunch of different pieces of legislation with one bill. And whenever you do that, it's called an omnibus bill. But often, uh, we're now seeing that, uh, that in the form of budgets is often uh, undertaking policy issues that uh, do not have financial implications, and there's been a lot of criticism of that, but um, governments then say the only way that we can get our policies in place and have a vote on them, a vote of confidence, would be to do it through a budget. Uh, we have recently had from Mr. Duncan in Ontario, we had an economic statement. Economic statements come in the fall and uh, normally presage what's going to be in the budget the, the next year. We're in a particular part of the economic cycle in, in the province where the province has uh, done as much as it can to give us all the bad news. And then in the second year of their mandate, that is when they're engaging in the policy process. So this is a good time to talk about this because this is when governments will be talking about policy. Um, and uh, even though there's no money and governments will announce that, there will still, um, still be an awful lot of policy making going on. They'll especially be looking for where they can do good things at the same time as achieve savings or neutral, uh, uh, neutral cost um, uh, policies that they come in place. And then uh, another place you'll see, especially if you go on any government website and look at either the premier, the ministers, uh, city councillors, um, uh, you'll see announceables where they issue news releases of small bits of policy that's being made that uh, usually is intended for um, uh, to um, to bring something in to spend a bit more money on something in uh, in a particular place, and so that the government remains very active by uh, having these announceables and these news releases. Uh, and again, you'll you'll see them especially 
in the large ministries, uh, Ontario and most other provinces has uh, about eight or nine very large ministries that are large operating ministries like finance, uh, like uh, where all the tax collection is and, and uh, goes on, where the Ministry of Transportation and Communications that runs things uh, like the salt trucks and the roads. In other words, big ministries that have their, their feet on the ground. The same is true for, for education, community and social services. And then there's some smaller ministries that are more policy ministries. Uh, I call them boutique ministries where they don't really have um, feet on the ground but um, have policy secretariats of various sorts. So it's um, in the age of the, the web, it, there's really, you know, years ago it, all of this was um, very hard to access, but now you can go onto any ministry's website, you can get their org charts, you can get their business plans, uh, you can look at what they're doing, you can go to each officer of parliament, for example, the provincial and, and uh, youth commissioner, um, you can uh, look at the ombudsman, the human rights commission, the environmental commission, and, uh, and the auditor general, and see what their policies are uh, in terms of how they watch dog ministry. Uh, and so it's, it's eminently followable nowadays. nowadays. You can't, it's not just question period in Parliament, but you can follow what various government ministries do. You can follow the public service. You can go to the public appointments uh, secretariat and find out what the 615 agency board, agencies, boards, and commissions in Ontario actually do, and also uh, Crown corporations and, um, and government foundations. It's all online. It's all available now. So that's, uh, it, it, it democratizes the the public policy making process because if you do know where to access these things, then you can go, you, you can play a much more important role in the policy, policy making process. So moving on, there, there really is a difference between policy, uh, politics and policy making. Um, and I would say the key difference between policy, politics and policy making is that doing policy, you're always trying to do good. You're not always trying to do good in politics. You, you may be trying to win in the, in the world of politics. And so your message in terms of a political message might be one where you're trying to appeal to the public and uh, you're not necessarily trying, uh, trying to only do good. You might be trying to win. I watched, um, for example, Ed Clark of the Trauma Dominion Bank yesterday talk about those times where he actually uh, uh, brought out bank policies that were not necessarily going to uh, benefit the bank, but felt that in the long term, really, the bank's place and its brand would be better off by having a policy that would not necessarily uh, benefit the bank in the, in the short to medium term. So even at the business level, what you'll find, and even though I'm mostly talking about government, you'll see that um, that, that the policy making is always uh, always about doing good. And I, I put it this way, and that is, uh, never once in the 28 years that I, that I walked into government offices did I ever say to myself, I'm going to go in and do bad policy today. Yet frequently people will go into a political office and say, we have to win the day, we have to get something in place, we have to beat the other guy. Policy making is not about that. Policy making is not about beating the other guy. That's what politics is about, and, and that's why I say that policy making is always about doing good. And you have to remember there are always different lenses through which to see an issue, and that is uh, the the role of the policy maker will always come up with a highly stylized uh, version of uh, a policy submission, sometimes called cabinet submissions at the province, provincial, and federal levels, which will say things like uh, we'll have five options. The do-nothing option, maintain the status quo, remember that's the option most often actually, actually chosen, do a little, do something middling, do everything, or do something different. So for example, uh, you know, if you were to talk about how do, you, how do you cover high costs in the north, well, uh, a lot of people are talking about subsidizing people so that they get more money to buy those high cost items. But of course, you could use a different lens, reframe it, and say, we are going to subsidize the supplier 
and make sure that all the prices of apples are the same in some far north community as they are in the city of Toronto so that you, you always have different ways. You can always raise the water or lower the bridge. And public policy makers and people who work for government are always thinking about how do we do, we can do something one way, but there's always going to be an alternative way to do it. And uh, there's many, many examples of it. And so another important part is compelling stories based on shared, shared values can frame evidence. Remember, evidence is never just evidence. Uh, it, the values that we bring to it, the, one ex uh, example that I'm fond of making is that when we see high school students coming out of um, high school, they get 98 and 99% and they're the top students, they'll be written up in the newspaper and you look at that 98 and 99% and you say, boy, is that ever a fabulous mark that that kid got. And yet at the same time, you could have a children's aid society, for example, that fails to apprehend one child. Uh, out of a thousand different cases they had. And that one in thousand will be seen as an almost complete failure in the system. So uh, that framing of the evidence in terms of how you're actually presenting something, how you're presenting success, how you're presenting failure, is all something that needs to be done. You can't just think in terms of brute or raw numbers, as I just showed you with that example. And finally, the constituencies do matter. Anti-poverty, the art, the environment, housing, is that you will have a whole group of people um, who will be in your space. And wherever you happen to be in your community of interest, you'll have others that are, um, that, that are, that are known to you but really not part of your group. And that's something that I call the uh, vertical conversation. And that's the topic of the uh, of the next webinar where we're going to go into some great, uh, much greater detail talking about um, the vertical space. Uh, and uh, for example, it, it just won't matter what the issue is, is you'll have some people that are very much hostile to government, very much outside it. Then you'll have people who are very close to government and very much considered insiders. And then you'll have everybody in between that uh, in those various parts of that state. So those constituencies do matter whatever the issue it is that you may be, um, that in the case of the advocate might be um, bringing forward or in the case of, um, certainly in the case of, of literacy, numeracy, et cetera. All of those things are important. They have these constituent communities and they all frame po their own policy as and their articulation of the course of action slightly differently. Those people who are able to, that, who have that magic of being able to talk to everybody in their community and broker between them often become the most powerful uh, people and have the most articulate voices. So if policy is the language of government and it's what they do, we really don't have much of a choice but to understand some of the basics of policy analysis and development. And that is if we, engage, if we wish to be engaged in the policy arena. Some people will not want to be in that arena. Some people will want to say, I just want something to happen. I just want somebody to do something. And I want government to do it, or I want the city to do it, or I want a business to, uh, to bring up a, 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 a certain uh, policy in place. But are you, you're asking yourself the question, am I going to be part of articulating that course of action, looking at the pros and cons of options, look at an implementation plan, think about evaluation, or am I going to leave that to others? And I'd say to the extent to which you leave it to others, you cede power, you cede authority to others to, to, to be in that space. But also, gover governments, of course, have their own permanent policy-making staff. And I, I've always said that we should really think of the trouble we'd be in if governments did not do good policy, if they didn't try to put good policies in place. Uh, if they followed the last persuasive argument they heard, then it would mean that a minister, the last argument that she heard uh, or he heard would be the one that they would go forward on. And so uh, that would take us back to the days of the kings and queens listening to orators back, back in uh, hundreds of years ago. So in many ways, policy development and policy ana analysis is really a stabilizer within the, uh, the, the, the political uh, community. And there's a bit of a yin and yang between the, the political sphere and the policy sphere, because the policy sphere is always looking at evidence, trying to weigh that evidence, frame that evidence, uh, trying to articulate courses of action that will be good for, uh, for, for a particular constituency or good for a particular public. 
and the cost of it and the constraint, the uh, uh, how how implementable something is is going to be very important. Um, uh, getting the right evidence, making sure that you have ways to to um, to discern what is good evidence and bad evidence is all very important. So, moving on. So the objective of public policy making uh, should be, if it isn't, uh, it should be, it should always be about achieving a public good. Uh, so it involves a process of making good decisions, and that, uh, again, Sherry Torsman talks about this in, in what is policy. And of course, pol policy does go wrong. And uh, you can see, for example, issues like the, uh, the Walkerton Inquiry of about um, uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, talked about, went into the, uh, an explanation and, the, and the evidence gathering as to not only how to write a situation, in other words, have clean, clean drinking water, but what's more important about these various inquiries is that they go in to say what went wrong, how did the policy making uh, process go, go awry, and, uh, and what we often see in the political sphere is that we'll say, well, the, it was the bureaucrats that did it, and the uh, and it wasn't the politics. And, it, it, you know, really both things can happen. You can have uh, bad politics that ends up in a, a, uh, uh, a situation where, um, for political reasons, you have bad policy. But often you have bad policy in the first place, and an inquiry often gets into those, those sorts of issues. Uh, really trying to look at what is best for the public, often that's why people don't like government, because it's considered to be uh, you know, looking over the public shoulder when the public should be allowed to free, be free to do what they wish to do and have liberty and, and authority over their own lives. But often in the public sphere, you're always trying to think, at least in public policy making, trying to articulate those forces of action, you're always trying to think of what is best. So when government doesn't always do good policy, uh, often happens when policies will try to follow public opinion. Um, counteracting bad subsidies with good subsidies, subsidies, for example. Or if we see situations like uh, in, in the current, um, uh, w where good evidence tell us, tells us the crime is going down, but we're, um, uh, but we're still building more prisons, uh, might be a situation where uh, the, politics of, uh, the, the politics of fear or the politics of uh, uh, of um, keeping people safe um, uh, result in public policy institutions that uh, uh, would follow public opinion but would not necessarily be the best thing to do. And of course, that's where you get all sorts of discussions about Big Brother and, uh, and why if Canadians believe there is more crime and there's more reported crime, and that's unreported crime, that is, then why wouldn't we? Uh, why, why would we take a particular action one way or another? So that all comes into that debate. And, and in fact, it's probably where politics and policy making uh, meet is where you sometimes see, uh, see uh, uh, bad policy making. And also, of course, you have unintended consequences. Um, the context is important because the time frame of government's business election cycle uh, they're trying to make the tough decisions early. You see this with the federal government, again, in the cycle. You have the bad stuff, the, uh, the, uh, the, the tough decisions being made early. Then you'll have a year of policy making. Then you'll have a year of policy articulation. And then in the fourth year, you go into the election. Now, this is really quite different from what we've had before, because at the provincial and the federal levels, we did not have fixed term elections. Well, now we do. And so you always know what the policy making cycle is going to be. You can time it, whereas before you might have a snap election in three, two or three years, and then you would have another, uh, like the Ray government went a full five years in its mandate. So you don't really know as a public participant exactly where you're, you're in the policy making cycle. It could be at different times, and it could be quite wonky. Whereas now, with the three-year term for the municipalities, the four-year terms for the federal provincial government, it's much easier to know where you are in the, in the government business slash election cycle. And the difference between an election and post-election periods, we go from the firm to the very fluid policy agenda. 
no uh, no example would be better than the current U.S. example, where you have um, where, where you have all the promises being made before November 6, and then we know absolutely for certain after that that so much of the realities of the public policy agenda that have to be attended to uh, are going to change that very firm policy agenda into a fluid policy agenda, whether it's Obama or Romney, it just doesn't make any make any uh, difference. But the sh politics does tend to have a short uh, span of uh, attention, and often it's a short life of policy. I put the quote in two years, it's not my problem. But then we should also note that there are long, long-term public policy agendas. I would say things like the Ontario Disabilities Act, the ODA, is a 25-year policy. We have a deinstitutionalization policy that really went from various governments, no matter what political stripes, for, for, more, than, uh, for more than 50 years. So some of the considerations are values, beliefs, and ethics, finding the social consensus. And really, there's six parts of that consensus, which I'm going to get in, into in, in the, uh, on my policy uh, musings on inequality. But it's really the issues of, and I'll say them very quickly here. We'll cover them again in the later lecture, of liberty, of loyalty, of authority, of caring, and of equality, and, um, and loyalty. Um, there's six in all, and uh, we'll get into that in the later uh, the later presentation. We need to think about the media attention, opinion polls, understanding the public mood, and in many ways we're now living in a gerontocracy where the uh, the public mood, in terms of one overall group, is being uh, run by uh, older people and what older people think, which is very different from before. Again. So the difference between government and the people who work there, government is heterogeneous. Uh, we, have, uh, we have all sorts of uh, situations where people, uh, we have people who work for the party, we have people who work in the public service, and the, the people who work in the public service in Ontario belong to three different groups in general, and that is to a senior management group that includes assistant deputy ministers, directors, and deputies, then through an administrative and um, uh, and professional module of people who um, uh, are sort of the creative class of government. And then we have a large group um, who actually do the implementation, the feet on the ground of government, who are in the public service union uh, of offices. So when you're trying to uh, figure out who's in government, it's not all the same. And of course, we have very large agencies, boards, and commissions that are semi-autonomous within government. and. Uh, so if you go to the LCBO, for example, that's a board, one of the 16 boards in Ontario, it, would you consider that person a civil servant? Well, not just because they wear blue shirts. Uh, are they not considered uh, public servants? But they're not public servants in the same way because they work for an independent board. Imagine what would happen if every time you wanted to put air miles on a, a, a bottle of red wine, you had to go back to the minister to ask the minister whether that would be a good decision to do or not. So there's a lot of government business that's actually done by semi-autonomous boards. Uh, I already noted how long-term reform can work and gave you a couple of examples that really are good examples outside of the, uh, outside of the areas of, um, that, that only work within those electoral cycles. So the temperament the, of the advocate and policymaker are often dif different. Advocacy is righteous based on the moral high ground. Uh, but policy making tends to be neutral. What activists and, and advocates often say, if I get involved in policy making, am I going to lose my edge? Am I going to be less of a firebrand? Am I going to be less of a war road warrior because I'm thinking in terms of options? Um, I would tend to say no, because you can still hold on to all of your beliefs and all of the things that you want and that you're passionate about, but at the same time, you're learning a skill, you're learning a new language. Uh, and it just happens to be the case that policy making will treat minds and hearts as an issue or an externality. In other words, it's not something that would be, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that would necessarily get into uh, the type of activism that one might have in a pamphlet, you're not going to get into those policy type discussions. You're going to be talking about what it is that you want. So just shortly on, a, again, the term policy is used in so many different areas that uh, 
I just thought I'd throw in that you know we've moved away from practices, rules, and our discussion here today into something I call big P policy, and then there are insurance policies. So the insurance policy is actually a contract. So the, the problem with policy, we use it in so many different contexts. We have it as a contract, we have it as a set of rules, we have it as a set of practices, and then we have it as articulating the course of action. So if you can keep all these straight, then it's going to be important in terms of uh, your understanding of policy. And I can tell you one of the reasons that it remains so murky for so many people is because the word policy is used. We can't stop people from speaking English in the way they want to use it. So I would love them to say practices. You know, when you say, what's your policy on when I have an in and out privilege at a parking lot, I would rather people not use the word policy, but they're going to continue to do it. So we have to disaggregate those various meanings of policy when we talk. So, um, so why taking policy um, is not just a better articulation of your own opinion. Uh, often people get into policy, and if you really talk to them very closely as to why they're getting into it, if they're not going into it in order to become a policy analyst in government and go up through that uh, as a career, uh, they'll often just want to be to to make their game a little bit better and start to think about how they can organize evidence and that sort of thing. But I think one of the principles of this uh, of this web webinar is that doing policy will mean that you will understand your own opinion better. And when you do that, it might even change your opinion, and that's not a bad thing. Um, if you look at, as every policymaker must, the consequences of an action. Uh, you have to think of Al Gore doing the uh, uh, the movie An Inconvenient Truth. He sat and talked for two hours about the consequences of inaction. He talked, he talked a little bit about what you should do, but mainly he was talking about what are the consequences if we don't do something. So that's one thing that all policymakers must do. They must think about the consequences of not doing something. They have to think about the consequences of doing a little, doing a lot, doing something different, and taking each policy issue that comes up, those wicked, difficult issues, and actually going through it and, uh, uh, and, and actually articulating it. So knowing the government does that, if you start to do it yourself, then you can start to participate in that policymaking process. So uh, one thing I'd like you to do, and that is, to, um, uh, if you are, for some of you who I know are going to come to the next webinars, is start um, thinking, uh, listen to music, and start to think of what's your best policy song ever. And uh, uh, one thing, I've, especially in talking to policy uh, with young people, uh, what I've done is uh, in trying to get their attention, and they'll often be the types of people who just want something. They don't want to sit around and articulate courses of action because that's uh, it's difficult in many ways. That's what government should be doing. And I try to um, uh, say, well, you really, your policy song is wannabe because you just want to talk about what you really, really want. And then when we talk about the boxer, is is uh, with Simon Garfunkel. That's the uh, that's the song. That's the policy song for the policy advocate who understands that people just want what they want, and they uh, they tend to disregard the things that, that uh, other people's issues. Uh, Against the Wind is Bob Seger's song, and he's, um, I've taken him to be talking, at least parenthetically, about policy making. And then finally, No Money Down is the song of the, uh, uh, of the person who says, I, I want, uh, as an advocate, they go in and they ask for just ev absolutely everything to be absolutely perfect. And of course, those are the people who, when they go into government ministers, are usually trying to jackrabbit away from them because they, uh, they're the type of people who are just going to articulate this grand vision which no minister uh, or government is ever going to put in. So um, that's how it's um, uh, So we'll j just hear a little of these songs right now. <laughs> I'd like you to try to imagine what it was like when uh, this um, Matt Rowe and Richard Stan um, actually wrote this. Can you imagine what it was like when the Spice Girls first heard it or first saw these words and say, gee, that sounds like it's going to be a really big hit. Um, 
I don't know, it just boggles the mind. But again, I use this as saying that this is usually the, the, the type of uh, advocacy and activism that you will get from younger people who will just, they'll be painfully wanting something, whether it goes as world peace, the environment, or anything else. And it's not policy advocacy because you're not really articulating uh, you're not really articulating a course of action that will affect other decisions and other things. You're really just saying, here's what I want. So there you have it, the lament of the boxer and uh, the Paul Simon, uh, which I have always thought of as the song for advocates trying to change government policy. <laughs> I can tell you when, when writing a really difficult cabinet submission um, and coming in and knowing you're going to have to uh, go in before ministers and deputies and uh, at a senior management committee and writing out policy and having uh, lots of different things on your plate all at one time, there's not, I don't think a day went by that I, that, that the strains of that song didn't go through my head. <laughs> as walking into uh, especially, uh, you know, high stakes um, meetings. And, uh, and so it came out at just the right time in the 70s to haunt me throughout my whole career in government. So here the last one is, the, uh, is Chuck Berry from 1954 talking about all the different things. What it really gets to me is, uh, is, is how he talks about this car that he wants. And if you, if you ever listen to the whole song, it's really quite funny, and I think he meant it to be funny talking about how he just got the perfect car. And I see so many advocacy groups that go into government and say, here's everything. They, they spent all this time articulating exactly what they, what they wanted. And, uh, and, and without any articulation of the course of action, not sub-options, not thinking of breaking their ask into 10 steps, not thinking about how to, how to say, well, what could we get, and then congratulate government, and then move on to the next thing. No, they just want it all. Uh, 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 and often that can be a mistake when dealing with governments, especially cash draft ones. You tell me what you want, and then sign that line. I'll have it brought down to you in 15 minutes. So there we are. So now I guess we can move on to questions, comments, and uh, criticism, and whatever. Hi, John. I'm, I don't know about everyone else, but I'm definitely going to have against the wind in my head all day. <laughs> um, I have a, a question here for you. Um, there's a view that government is losing its public policy capacity. What's your perspective on, on this? Uh, I don't think government is losing its public policy capacity. Uh, I think they are getting it from elsewhere much more so than they are getting it from their own professional public service. Uh, there was a time, uh, and especially in the immediate post-war period, um, going back 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, the government would tend to look uh, to, to its own professional civil service for its policy advice and for the articulation of uh, uh, policy analysis and development. Uh, but various ministers and governments uh, with an ideological bent have tended to say, well, I'm not getting the advice I want within my, the cadres of my own ministries. So I'm going to go further afield. And 
the problem in doing that for many, many years was the fact that then they en ended up in the hands of lobbyists and public interest groups and that sort of thing. They weren't necessarily getting the objective evidence-based policy advice that they would want. And that's why you've seen, especially since the Lobbying Act, uh, various lobbying legislation that has been brought in uh, at various levels of government, certainly at provincial and federal level, and certain certain degrees in municipalities too, is that we'll, we'll say, okay, you're either a lobbyist or you're not. And if you're not a lobbyist and you still want to have influence in government, you might do something like create an institute or create a center of some sort. So governments will often go outside of their own professional public service to get that advice from various different think tanks of various sorts or or programs within universities uh, to get that sort of, uh, uh, of, of high quality advice. Um, at the same time, I think there might be a, a strand in that question that's saying that, that government be, might be getting the advice and not following it. And that's certainly the case where um, agenda-driven politics, where uh, uh, there was a big push in the 70s and 80s for uh, where governments would, would would campaign on a set of promises, and then they get into uh, power, and then they would do whatever they wanted. And so, with various red books and uh, various types of, uh, uh, of policy agendas, governments were much more tied and got a lot more political capital out of actually following the the, the policy, the public policy agendas that they ran on, and that also tended to d diminish the role, but not necessarily the number of public servants, uh, but certainly diminish their role because once the government had campaigned on it, they said, well, now we told the public that's what we're going to do, and, and now we've got to do it, whether it's, whether, whether it's right or not. You know, perfect examples when Mr. McGinney uh, campaigned on the, the idea of having, in 2003, of having coal-fired generators. Uh, gone by 2007, obviously a professional public service went to, uh, uh, to do the minister and the premier and said, well, if you do that, you know, you're going to have brownouts and blackouts. You're not going to have any electricity because we just don't have enough time to do, to actually put that policy into implement, implementable practice in the time frame that you promised it. So that's often uh, uh, what happens in, in, those, in those situations. But um, uh, so I agree with the idea that the government, in terms of the professional civil service, has lost policy capacity and continues to do so. And Mr. Harper certainly got rid of them, uh, an awful lot of his professional public service uh, because uh, uh, perceived, perceived requirements to have people there to, to articulate courses of action is not there in agenda-driven uh, politics. And again, would often go, if you're going to get high quality advice, would then go to the those outside think tanks that would actually brand themselves as, as having that type of uh, public policy advice that would um, that, that would mesh well with the, the politics of the party in power. Okay, I have another one here. Um, you mentioned that policy analysts' aim is to do good. However, that is not always the case for government officials. How do you find a balance between the two, given that policy analysts must usually follow government orders? Don't they have a practice and don't they have to practice a limited role in influencing public policy? Well, I think we have to make a distinction first about who we're talking to, uh, talking about. And uh, I always like to do it by business card. And the business card of anybody who is in government but is a, um, a card-carrying liberal, in other words, they're working in a minister's office, um, will have a uh, coat of arms on the top left corner of that um, that card, or if it's a federal government, you'll see that they have the coat of arms in the uh, uh, in the in the middle and off the, uh, on the card. But for a public servant, is all you're ever going to see is the trillium uh, for the Ontario, uh, the stylized trillium for the Ontario official, and the um, the little red um, the half red flag with the uh, in our flag with the left red bar on it and the red maple leaf in the middle so that you know who you're talking about. Now, unfortunately, often those people are called officials, uh, public servants, without making a distinction to whether those people are actually party members versus people who are 
um, specifically required to be apolitical. For example, when I was in the senior management of the Ontario government, um, I was required not to be in any political party, not even allowed to put a sign on my lawn, um, which is not true of, um, of the unionized civil servants. But the uh, uh, so it's very important that when we say a public servant or a public official or an official, uh, that we know that we're talking about whether that person's on the political side or the uh, or within the professional civil public service. That said, I think there's very few cases where you have. Uh, public servants who are apolitical, in other words, in the non-political part of the uh, uh, of the, the public service of Ontario, where they would be involved, you know, uh, in rogue activities. Are very, it, it happens every so often, but often you find that the officials uh, in government were involved in, in and not doing good. In other words, they're doing they're they're, they're practicing politics at the same time as they're practicing. Uh, policy is that you'll often find that amongst those who actually are, are are party members. So how do you mitigate against it? I think is uh, you have to have very good relations, uh, and uh, this is when we come to the role, at least in the provincial side, where you will come to the role of the deputy minister, and the deputy minister is an order in council appointment uh, by the government, which means that they essentially. Uh, the, they, they serve at the pleasure of the government and can be put in any particular role or, um, or let go without, uh, it, without any recourse. Uh, but, but those deputy ministers are the people who really are the, um, are the ones that keep the firewall properly, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the relationships and the roles and the practices between the minister's office and the professional public service, and they're a very skilled cadre of uh, of the people who are largely unsung, who um, who who provide that kind of guidance to their ministries. And of course, you can see um, where it goes wrong is when you have a, a group like Orange that were acting outside of the the political sphere and and were not really coming under the uh, the auspices of the professional public service. And so, when you get agencies boards and commissions that often go their own way uh, without, uh, without the proper safeguards. Uh, so my answer to the question is to always ensure that you have that good cadre of deputy ministers and all have good, uh, well-chosen boards of people with good generosity of spirit and, uh, and who are not advising or consenting to arbitrary measures. And, and so I would see that largely as a good human resource strategy throughout government and making sure that the, uh, uh, that the framework of accountability is, uh, is firmly in place so that you don't get the sort of finger pointing that we get when some things go wrong. Um, can you discuss the role of evidence in today's policy context? Yeah, the role of evidence. Well, when I'm when I'm feeling down about this, I have a uh, an expression that I use that often that what we seem to have in government these days is uh, is uh, is decision-based evidence making. Now, of course, the uh, the proper expression expression, and you'll hear this uh, often from governments, is uh, evidence-based decision making, which is really inductive logic. Uh, in other words, you're going to look to what the evidence that you find using uh, good rules of evidence, uh, which can come from science and which can come from other philosophical and uh, uh, areas. You really have to ensure that there is a good, solid place, that there's a space being made for the evidence that is being gathered to come forward. So we, we have the tragedy now of, uh, in my view, of having our, um, our main statistical agency, Statistics Canada, having a much lesser role um, in terms of the gathering of, um, uh, the gathering of the evidence that we need to run the country properly. Um, and that, uh, so to the extent that we're actually um, Pursuing a course where we're going to have less evidence uh, is really um, a wrong-minded uh, course as we go forward. But the evidence that we do have, well, that lesser level of evidence should have a, a very good place 
in uh, in uh, in government. And of course, uh, we have several ministers in Ontario right now. Uh, certainly, uh, if you look at their training, you see that uh, Deb Matthews um, got her doctorate and uh, from a school that very highly prizes evidence-based decision making. You have Dr. Hoskins and uh, John Malloy, both uh, PhDs from Oxford, um, which is sort of the, the, uh, the, the elite schools, all very highly evidence uh, or highly regard and highly value evidence um, going into the decision making. Uh, I think what you often will have uh, reports and public policy being made on a set of principles. And of course, having principles uh, uh, will lar largely lead you to um, uh, deductive as opposed to inductive logic, because you would say, does whatever we're going to do meet with our set of principles? And you would constantly be going back to your principles as a touchstone. So I think you've got, to, on the one side, you have to have an important bedrock set of principles um, which, you, which you move from, but then allow evidence uh, various sorts to come in, not only to to inform the policies, but also to shift and and change the lenses and the frame and the paradigms in which the uh, the evidence is being looked at. And I don't think there's that not, not near enough uh, um, attention is being paid to the whole idea of um, the framing of evidence. And again, I tried to use that example where 99% is considered great, and where 99% is considered awful. Um, we have uh, evidence that never speaks for itself and never stands on its own as much as people will use that expression. It's always framed in a certain way. And uh, I think it, if it's properly framed, uh, good use of history, good use of the record, good use of um, the fu what I call the future perfect tense, and that is where you try to project yourself out 20 years from now and saying, okay, what will the world look like if we do X or Y or Z? And what will the word world look like if we don't uh, do X, Y, or Z? And often that's when you really start to construct the, the evidentiary framework that you're going to need to say, well, well, how will we know whether we've done well? So if we're thinking about that question of how, we, how will we know if we've done well, we're, we're, we're automatically starting to not just frame our evidence, but to, um, to, to talk about the type of evidence that we're going to gather um, to, so that we will know whether we've done well or not. OK, uh, John, quickly, because we have a few more questions here. Um, what sort of approach by advocates will meet with a more attentive response by government? More attentive response, if you, uh, I, very quickly, I'd say if you feel their pain. Uh, it's very easy to know what they're going through right now, because they tell you. They say they're not going to spend that much money. Uh, that they have a fiscal problem, and so governments will be looking to uh, people who can can look at, at at what it is that they that they require, and be able to take their ask and break it down into ten steps, ten baby steps, and then say, look, if we really were to be able to get one tenth of what what it is that we want, and we were able to articulate that in a way that would meet with very good public support, and not um, create groups that are going to be uh, uh, to be against uh, uh, particular policies because they're so um, the, you know because they're so disruptive. Uh, I think we're um, I think those are some of the things to, to take uh, take into account. In other words, uh, be very careful that what you're asking for is not disruptive. Uh, ask for something smaller than the whole ask of what you want, you can pay attention to your 100% of your goals over time and not lose your advocacy spirit as a result. Um, but make sure that you're, that you're willing to look at, the, um, at the, uh, the type of process that government would have to go through itself to come up with the answers that, that it can come up with. And then you're, gonna, then you're gonna get a much more attentive response. And then also try to lead public opinion to a certain extent. Government's not trusted in leading public opinion, but uh, individuals and, uh, and, and people who are in the act activism and, act and advocacy world, um, you know, if they pay attention to swaying public opinion, they, they have much better chance of doing that than government ever would. 
Okay, great. Uh, it's 2 o'clock, so that's uh, all the time we have. I encourage people to come to the next uh, few webinars. There's five more after this that will build on each other, so, uh, so you can uh, learn more about public policy. So um, thank you so much, John, and thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.